Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Sutz here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Amanda Vinicky reporting live from Chicago's Lincoln Square community. On the show tonight, what a spike in air pollution means for Chicagoans during the coronavirus. Summer academic enrichment programs go online. The mayor's COVID recovery task force releases its report, what does it recommend for the city's neighborhoods? How one woman's quilt brought women together from all around the country. And a confectionery conundrum in Ask Jeffrey. And Paris, as I mentioned, I'll be co-anchoring tonight live from Chicago's Lincoln Square community. It's a community with a long cultural heritage where this afternoon activists sought to bring attention to disparities throughout the city. But first, back to you for developments from today. And we'll look forward to that, Amanda. Chicago police announced murder charges against a man accused of shooting three people who tried to stop him from looting a liquor store amid protests following the death of George Floyd. Chief of Detectives Brendan Dinahan announced the charges against Andrew Sneed, who he described as a convicted felon well known to police late this afternoon. Dinahan alleges Sneed shot the victims after he had looted the liquor store at 5069 West Madison. Those same community members who confronted him previously, about two hours previously, and he walked across the street and he shot three of them, causing one of them to die. Police say the man killed was 27-year-old Tommy Gatewood. A 21-year-old man and an 18-year-old woman were also shot but survived the attack. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says an announcement on Chicago Public Schools reopening plans for the fall is coming soon. We plan to make an announcement relatively soon about what that might look like. But of course, we'll have contingency plans um, if our public health metrics um, are not where we need them to be. Um, in late August. The mayor says she will leave it to CPS to announce the details of the plan. The Trump administration has been pressuring schools to reopen in the fall and has threatened to cut funding for schools that do not fully reopen, although it is not clear how the administration could do that. 15th Ward Alderman Raymond Lopez says a brick was thrown through the window of his Brighton Park home earlier this morning. Security cameras caught the attack on video, which occurred at about 1.20 a.m. The garage of Alderman Lopez's neighbor was also set on fire. Lopez said on Twitter the attack was an attempt by gangs to intimidate him and his family because of his anti-gang efforts. He added, quote, this attack only strengthens my resolve to get rid of, to rid our communities of these urban ter terrorists. Workers at Loretto Hospital on the west side vote to strike later this month. Citing a breakdown in negotiations with the management, the roughly 200 employees, including crisis workers, food and other support staff, say they plan to strike on July 20th. SEIU Healthcare is the union that represents the workers. They say negotiations had been ongoing since December, but management had, quote, failed to bargain in good faith. A spokesperson says the hospital continues to negotiate with the union in hopes of reaching a deal. And public health officials confirm more than a thousand new coronavirus cases in Illinois since yesterday. It's the first time the daily total has surpassed a thousand since early June. Illinois now has recorded more than 150,000 cases of COVID-19 in the state. Officials also report another 20 Illinois residents have died from the virus for a total of more than 7,000 deaths. Lincoln Square, accessible via the Brown Line, is so-called in honor of the 16th U.S. president. A bronze statue of a beardless Abraham Lincoln sits on a street corner in the commercial district. According to data released by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning last month, it's a well-off area with a median income of 73,000 and is about 65 percent white, 19 percent Hispanic or Latino. It's known for its commercial square, Victorian homes, and connection to those of German heritage. And Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky joins us now live at the Dank House in Lincoln Square. Amanda. Paris, German immigrants made their way to this area in the 1840s and founded Lincoln Square, and their footprint remains. You have Mers Apothecary, one of the oldest German apothecaries dating back to the late 1800s. You have Hansa Clipper, you have the Hooten Bar, you'll have the Mai Pole in Lincoln Square along with a beautiful facade. And we even have a piece of the Berlin Wall in the Western Brown Line Station. 
especially here at the Dock House, which just reopened this week after being closed for 16 weeks due to the coronavirus. The Cultural Center promotes German heritage and cultural events, but it's also evolved into a community space. Tomorrow, the Dock House is hosting its first post-COVID-19 event where a small group of participants in real life will be in this room to learn to make German pretzels. We have a pretzel meister here. Yes, that is a real title who will be leading folks who aren't able to join in because of social distancing and limitations or because they, perhaps they aren't comfortable. Well, he'll be leading them to make pretzels over Zoom. Another COVID-inspired change, the Dunk House just ordered masks with that see-through vinyl so that German language teachers, students will be able to learn by helping to see the sounds that their lips are forming. Now, nearby, the store Eco and the Flamingo opened its storefront just a couple of days ago. Delayed from the Earth Day grand opening that its owners had originally envisioned, it purports to be Chicago's first zero waste shop, but they too had to make some modifications due to the coronavirus. Bringing your own, your own containers into our store and filling them here rather than purchasing something um, that you're probably going to end up throwing away or in, in your best manners try to recycle, but generally it won't end up in that place anyway. So um, we're just trying to help people sort of transition into that less throwaway culture life. Originally people were going to be able to um, uh, you know, dispense all of their own goods, um, f but for now and maybe forever, we'll be doing the all the food goods. Anything um, where your hand kind of has to go inside, like these boxes. Um, so we wear gloves. Safety first. Now, the Shanghai Inn on Damon isn't new. It has been in Chicago for three generations. Before the pandemic, the Shanghai Inn was turning out 1,500 of its signature egg rolls. They're really special because they have a hint of peanut butter in them, and that's what sets them apart. Now, 1,500 of them a week. These days, they're down to about 800. The restaurant just recently reopened. Even though it could have kept going with takeout orders throughout the stay-at-home owner, its owner said, she held a meeting with her staff and they collectively decided to close down. Now they are back, but not completely. Still, they are not allowing dine-in customers or even El Fresco. We'd all decided again that it's best to do carry out and deliveries. That's the best way. Even with our delivery orders, we leave it at the door, contactless, carry out the same way. So I think this is the best way for us for now. It cut my business in half but we chose to be safe. And for this, protect our customers, protect our staff. It's also pricier these days to make the handcrafted sauces and dishes that were passed down to her, the recipes by her father. She says it's been great to hear from customers who reached out throughout the spring to make sure that the Shanghai Inn would be back. But not everywhere has made it. Neighbors bemoaned the closure of the 24-hour Greasy Spoon Jerry's Grill, known for its ham on the bone sign, which closed in May. Its owner did tell Block Club that it had to shut its doors due to COVID-19. Now, just across the street from Jerry's, now empty, on the corner of Montrose and Western is Wells Park. Now, that's where I met Jocelyn Prince. She's a leader of Honk for Justice. Demonstrators have been protesting at a busy street corner somewhere in the north side daily, yes, daily since June 2nd. They're in Lincoln Square each Thursday. Prince was born on Chicago's South Side and said the objective is to raise awareness about the Black Lives Matter movement. She says it is a family-friendly demonstration. Kids can take part. There are posters and markers so that children can make signs. But she says the whole point is to be loud. Cars honking, people bring pots and pans out. We had one guy show up with a trombone at one of the protests. We had um, some drummers, marching band drummers. Uh, so it really is about disturbing the peace. And we do get complaints. We've had the police called on us. Um, people get upset that we're disturbing them in the middle of the afternoon. But we want to keep the volume up uh, so that people here on the north side understand what black people are going through, not just here in Chicago, but around the country. And more Paris from the Lincoln Square community later, including how a local nonprofit has been serving several areas. But first, back to you.
All right, Amanda, we'll look forward to that. And up next, what a spike in poor air quality means for Chicagoans. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. You don't need me to tell you it's hot out there, and hot summer days usually mean poor air quality. For seven straight days in early July, Chicago saw air quality warnings due to high levels of ozone and particulate matter in the air. So what do these spikes mean for the health of Chicagoans, especially during a respiratory pandemic? And how are some of the most polluted neighborhoods across the city coping with the short and long-term ramifications of unhealthy air. Joining us with more are Angela Tin, National Senior Director at the American Lung Association, Cheryl Johnson, Executive Director of People for Community Recovery, an environmental advocacy group based in the Altgeld Gardens homes on Chicago's far south side, and Kim Wasserman, Executive Director of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Welcome all of you to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. Thank you. First, starting with you, Angela, let's take a look at some of the air pollution spikes over the last seven days. Why does hot air lead to poor quality air? Well, you're talking about ozone. And when ozone comes from combustion sources, such as cars and industrial facilities. And so when you have things coming out of the tailpipe and you have heat and you have sunlight, you have ozone and ozone is one of the pollutants that we're concerned about. And I should mention in those graphs, we saw a lot of orange and red. Safe to say orange and red means concerning air quality. Um, Kim Wasserman, you live in Little Village, a neighborhood that has struggled with air quality for so long. How is this heat affecting the residents there right now? It's tough. Um, you know, the reality is not only are we in a pandemic, but uh, 60623 um, was one of the hardest hit zip codes in the city of Chicago and folks are struggling. And the fact that a demo, yeah, the implosion happened on April 11th and exacerbated the situation. By right, this was from the Crawford coal plant. Correct. Um, does not help any. Um, people are dying. People are suffering. People are struggling to breathe. And this heat is of no relief whatsoever. And Cheryl, there's also a long history of pollution on the far south side uh, in the Elk Hill neighborhood, uh, Elk Hill Gardens neighborhood. Uh, tell us how this heat is exacerbating those problems there. Well, it, it's, it's tremendous because we have a high incidence of respiratory ailments in the community, which is exacerbated by some of the industrial processes in our, in our community. Right across the street, we have the Water Recommendation District of the Greater Chicago sludge bed. So the emissions from that alone would trigger many of the respiratory problems that we are experiencing in our community. So this around this time, this is the worst time for any of our community when it comes to air quality issues. It's bad, you know, but uh, people don't recognize it uh, because uh, in my particular neighborhood, we always been an isolated community, a forgotten community. So, um, um, and, and that tends to be problematic. And Angela, we mentioned the higher ozone levels. We mentioned the higher particulate matter. Uh, Cheryl is talking about the health problems. Make the connection for me between this hot air, the higher ozone, and what health impacts that causes. Well, the hot air causes the ozone to be formed. Um, and the ozone would not be formed without sunlight and hot air. And so when we're already having a problems breathing, uh, we have a lot of emissions from the cars and the trucks and the power plants. Um, and you're in a community where you have nowhere to go except in your home and you're breathing this every day. There are short-term and long-term effects, respiratory problems uh, with uh, air pollution. And certainly that's been exacerbated in the age of COVID-19. You know, uh, an ongoing issue here is the controversial scrap metal company, General Iron, which is moving from Lincoln Park to the southeast side. We spoke with Peggy Salazar from the Southeast Side Environmental Task Force in South Chicago a few weeks ago uh, about that move. Let's play a clip of that. We get left behind, way behind, okay? So let me give you an example. The way I see it, the city wants the tax dollars from these industries. We're here to accommodate that. 
So basically what she's saying is, you know, th these companies generate a lot of money, but they get put into neighborhoods, mostly black and brown neighborhoods, and they hurt health over there. So Cheryl, what's your reaction to General Iron coming down to the southeast side of Chicago, not far from Oak Hill Gardens? Well, uh, we uh, t uh, totally uh, don't want to see that in our neighborhood because it's only going to aspirate the problems that we already have in our community. And and, and and it's not just talking about respiratory issues, it's cardiovascular problems yes. that many of us are experiencing that in our community. So we why do we always have to be the dumping ground for the for the city or the state of Illinois? Uh, we have we have shared our burden of hosting these type of facilities in our community. And if they if the north side of Chicago don't want it, we sure don't want it either. So, um, and they are bad players. They have many accidents, uh, explosions at this facility. So who said they're going to be good, good neighbors in our neighborhood? They, they have None had the some explosions. They good in our neighborhood. They have had some explosions there the last few weeks, and environmental officials have okayed that move. And Kim, you mentioned the Crawford coal plant. You mentioned the demolition of the smokestack, which caused all that dust. Neighborhood residents put a halt to any further demolition. What is the latest? When is the rest of that going to come down? Um, unfortunately, Hilco um, is, has the green light as of this past Monday. Um, there is nothing more the city can do. They are legally allowed to be able to move forward. And I think to Cheryl's point, this is the real problem that we're having with not just Hilco being a bad player, but with how the city uh, permits and allows this type of development. Uh, once again, the lives of black and brown bodies don't seem to matter for anything. The tax dollars are more important. Um, and in our neighborhood, that's clear day in and day out, given that they can continue to move forward. So they're going to be demolishing the second part of that building, and they're going to be building their warehouse. And the health of our community pretty much means nothing and um, and to the city or to Hillcombe. They're basically building a, a distribution center there, and, and you're concerned about all the trucks that are going to come in and the diesel exhaust. Uh, Angela, uh, um, what can everyday Chicagoans do to try to mitigate some of the poor air quality right now? Well, the problem is, is that, you know, the, the, it comes from the industrial sources, of the, as the lady says, it comes from the transportation sources. So distribution centers and, and the truck traffic all causes the pollution. And things that can be done to mitigate, uh, for example, include uh, driving cleaner cars, uh, staying indoors when there's a bad pollution day, using alternative fuels like ethanol and biodiesel, um, driving electric cars. I know it doesn't answer some of the questions about the environmental impact impacts from industry, but this is what we can do to reduce the pollution from um, mobile transportation sources. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. My thanks to Angela Tin, Cheryl Johnson, and Kim Wasserman. Thank you. And for more, you. you're welcome. And for more on the environment in Chicago, go to WTTW.com slash news to learn about how the EPA is cleaning up some south side baseball fields containing high levels of arsenic and lead. And up next, Mayor Lightfoot releases the COVID Recovery Task Force report. What does it recommend? But first, a look at the weather. <laughs> Still to come on Chicago Tonight, summer education enrichment programs move online, but are they working? How one quilt is bringing women together from all around the country. Jeffrey Bayer has the scoop on some Chicago ice cream history in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. New ways of exploring the architectural history of Chicago. And in viewer feedback, your thoughts on the changing idea in the name of Boys Town and other questions about names and language. But first, COVID has helped put Chicago in a precarious fiscal and economic situation, but the silver lining is it gives the city a chance to start over and try and solve its unique challenges. A new report recommends how to do that. Some of those recommendations include accelerating neighborhood investment on the south and west sides, addressing trauma, and expanding economic opportunity. This report, which was issued by the city's COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, came out today. Mayor Lightfoot says she is ready to act on these recommendations. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity for us. This is our great Chicago moment to really re-envision our city and our region in a way that moves us forward. And joining us now with more details from this report is WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon. Um, Heather, what was the reason for putting this report together and who was involved? 
Well, 10 weeks ago, Mayor Lightfoot stood at the foot of the old Chicago Water Tower and said she had formed a group of more than 200 civic leaders, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, and had charged them with basically crafting a recovery course for Chicago in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, which was really at its height back then. And today she went to the South Shore Cultural Center which you just saw to reveal those results, which really is a sweeping call for Chicago to take this opportunity to address longstanding systemic problems. And Heather, highlight the main areas this report takes on. Well, I was really struck that its very first recommendation was to address Chicago's trauma through an expansion of Chicago's mental health services. And as you know, Paris, this was a point of serious contention during the 2020 budget hearings where the mayor declined to reopen six mental health clinics closed by former Mayor Rahm Emanuel, even though she said she was willing to do that during the campaign. So this really sort of harkens back to that debate and really roots so much of what Chicago is struggling with as sort of a mental health issue, a public health issue, which of course not only exacerbates the pandemic, but has exacerbated so much of the violence that we've seen in recent weeks on Chicago's South and, and West. And no matter what neighborhood we go visit, I mean, mental health is uh, the top of the, uh, of the needs in those communities. So how does, how does this report suggest getting Chicago to a place where it has enough mental health providers? Well, it calls for an expansion of Chicago's public health workforce, but you're right, the devil is in the details. And as you alluded to, the city is facing a $700 million right. deficit just for this year. Who knows what the city's budget deficit looks like for 2021? So it's not really clear how the mayor can pay for these huge ideas, but she said that she would try by reprioritizing the city's investments and also asking the business community to step up. And Heather, you know, the task force was co-chaired by Sam Skinner, a Chicago native who served as White House Chief of Staff under George H.W. Bush. Here's some of what Skinner had to say. This report gives us a battle plan, and I can guarantee you, having worked with our mayor, uh, she will not let this sit on the shelf. So Heather, what's the likelihood that this does not sit on the shelf? Well, that is where so many task force reports of this nature have ended up. However, what's interesting about this report is that it builds on so many of the initiatives already announced by Mayor Lightfoot, designed to address poverty through the Invest Southwest initiative, which pledges $750 million in investments on the South and the West side, as well as other initiatives to fight poverty and to expand opportunity. Uh, as, as as we saw last week, she announced a plan to extend broadband to 100,000 Chicago public school students. So this report maybe stands a better chance than others of making it into reality, but it's simply because this report reflects the mayor's priorities that she's been pushing since she took office and before the pandemic reshaped our lives. And as you mentioned, Heather, so many difficult fiscal choices have to be made this year and next and, and probably for the foreseeable future. Thank you so much. And Thanks, you bet. And by the way, in the interest of full disclosure, WTTW and WFMT CEO Sandra Cordova Misek was a part of this task force. And you can read Heather's full story on our website where you'll find a link to the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force report. That's at WTTW.com slash news. And now let's toss it right back to Amanda Vinicky, who's close by co-anchoring tonight in Lincoln Square on Chicago's north side. Amanda. Yes, at Paris. I'm joined now by Melissa Sabota. She's a board member with the Friendship Center Food Pantry, celebrating 50 years. Got to say, I, I love that name. What is the mission and how has it changed of late? So the Friendship Center is a food pantry. Um, we also have a hot meals program and we also ha serve a pet food pantry for families who want to keep their pets with their families. And you're serving a whole lot more of all of these entities and individuals and furry friends these days. We are. So during the COVID pandemic, about one in three food pantries uh, throughout the city of Chicago actually had to close their doors. Um, so since then, we have opened our doors to all residents of the city of Chicago who are in need of food, um, pet food. And we even have a, hot, a meals program where we're delivering food to um, seniors who are homebound.
So previously just serving residents of the surrounding area based in Lincoln Square in the north side, but now everywhere. How are you able to stay and continue doing this while others had to shut down due to the coronavirus? Well, we have a wonderful community that supports us. We have also worked very hard um, to fight for every penny, every dollar to, to, in order to keep our doors open because we know that the mission that we are serving is so vitally important for all residents um, and pets. How have you seen this? We've talked about numbers and um, a growing need, but how have you witnessed that? So just um, in the last couple of weeks, we've had our busy, busiest single day that we've had in our entire 50-year history. Um, we served about 150 individuals, which uh, rounded out to over 500 fam uh, people. I'm sorry, we served five, 150 individuals came in, and that's about 500 uh, people total that we fed. Um, we usually serve about 2,000 people on a monthly basis. That's since doubled. Doubled, wow. And it is a different sort of procedure as well, because previously it would be as if um, people could almost go shopping in your pantry, but no longer. So what does service look like these days? So services look very different. Um, we pre-bag the food for every family that comes to our doors, and we provide it in to-go bags, so grocery bags, things like that, which are something that we are always in need of. Um, we also have a lot of safety protocols in place for not only our, our volunteers, but also our clientele, such as social distancing, um, hand sanitizing, gloves, face masks, all of that. So it looks very different. And these are kits almost that are catered to the family that will be receiving it. Indeed, yes. And so you, you kind of touched on this, but these are now transported in bags. So if you aren't able to give food or a monetary donation to the Friendship Center, what could you give? You're looking for other donations as well, right? We are. We actually, um, because we, we are providing these meals in bags, we are, if anybody has bags, it doesn't have to be reusable. They can be plastic, jewel, whatever bags. If you have them, you want to donate them, bring them over to the Friendship Center during our open hours. We'll happily take them and then reuse them to provide food to the families in need. I know that um, there certainly are some of us who have accumulated quite a few <laughs> when you were told to no longer longer bring in reusable bags to shops, and so that has been a bit of an issue, of course. Yes. But it's not just bags, also shampoo, soaps, things like that. We actually give out to not only our clients, we also give uh, the, the soap and shampoo out to homeless people, um, babies, uh, baby needs, formula, diapers, feminine hygiene products, all of that is stuff that we try to give our, our clients um, as much as possible. Well, thank you so much for your hard work and your service, and we hope that those numbers start to reverse. Um, Paris, back to you. Certainly shows that there's still a lot of need out there for food pantries. Thank you, Amanda. And up next, summer education enrichment programs are moving online. Is it working? Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. A national debate is raging about how, when, and if schools will reopen this year. But right now, summer educational programs have moved online to keep students from the age of 4 to 18 ready for the fall whether they're entering kindergarten, high school, or college. So how well is it working, and what's at stake for students and families if efforts fall short? Joining us are Jonathan Swain, President and CEO of Link Unlimited Scholars, and Vince Mino, Director of Community Outreach and Marketing at Midtown Educational Foundation. I want to start off showing a clip of Link Unlimited Scholars, Jonathan Swain. Here's a look at some of your students uh, who work on college preparedness graduating your program. Welcome to the Link Unlimited Scholars Award Celebration. All right, so these are real important programs for students to bridge that gap, to be ready for college. Jonathan Swain, how are you doing it this summer where it all has to be done online? Well, I think you described it right there, Paris. So everything has to be done virtually. And so we are, have drafted a curriculum and put one together. We've engaged teachers, uh, certified teachers who are uh, excited about trying to do new things in the classroom. And bringing those together, we're able to uh, deliver a culturally responsive curriculum to our students that has them engaged, showing up every day, and excited about learning. And do you have the normal buy-in that you have um, if, it, if it was an in-person program? Actually, I think it's exceeding it a bit, um, partly because of the challenges that went on with 
uh, online learning towards the end of the school year. And I think some students feeling a, uh, a bit down about their learning experience. Uh, being able to deliver, deliver the curriculum that we do, I think students are really engaged. They're, they're, they're uh, feeling like they can see themselves in the curriculum and they're showing up excited uh, in, in a way that's probably different than even when we're in person. And Vince, uh, the Midtown Education Foundation deals with a lot of low-income students, especially in the Hispanic Latino community. First of all, describe very briefly what programs you do offer to those students. So we have two centers. We have the Midtown Center for Boys and the Metro Achievement Center for Girls. Uh, both programs are four weeks long, July 6th to July 31st. And they offer everything from apprenticeships for the high school kids, which are paid, uh, the one programs for fourth through sixth grade students are much more organized for, you know, trying to keep the little ones a little bit more focused. And then we have a Metro and Midtown Achievement Program for middle school students that helps them uh, orient themselves and prepare for high school. Especially. All right, and same question to you. Are you able to have success uh, carrying out all these programs where students can't be in person and engaging? Uh, even more success. So we've been able to reach a wider audience digitally and because we don't have to worry about the logistics of actually having parents like drop their kids off, things like that, we're actually we're able to exceed our enrollment goals and we have a wait list in all of our programs. And Jonathan, um, back to some of the students that you deal with, you know, there's data showing that African-American students have a four year college graduation rate of about 40 percent. Um, how do you improve those rates? Well, I think one, it starts with college exposure at a younger age. Um, kids need to understand about college even when they're in elementary school. I mean, the better high school you're able to attend, the more likely you are to complete college. The better your uh, ninth grade grades, the more likely you are to complete college. So I think it starts with that kind of exposure. But then secondly, I think it has a lot to do with uh, college matching. Um, African Americans generally are undermatched. And what that means is they are not matched with the selectivity of the college that uh, their grades, de uh, grades demand. Um, and so when you match students appropriately, you're able to get better financial resources and you increase the probability of their completion. So I think uh, those are probably the two biggest elements that uh, we look at when it comes to increasing college graduation rates. And Vince, you know, we've talked a lot about on this program about COVID-19, how it's impacted families, uh, people who are out of work, out of a job, uh, especially in the Hispanic Latino community. How has that impacted the ability of students to really focus on your curriculum? Well, yeah, well, it all starts with the parents first. So most of our parents or many of our parents are essential workers. So people in the healthcare industry, restaurant workers, uh, laborers. So it's definitely affected them and their ability to be present for a lot of the e-learning. Um, we are hearing nothing but gratitude and appreciation for the fact that we are having our summer programs. And it really does help to take a load off of the parents' minds to know that they have some organized activities and things that are fun for their kids to participate in the summertime. All right, we're about a month or so away from kids going back to schools, at least in Chicago. President Trump has some thoughts on what he thinks should happen. Let's hear what he said yesterday. They think it's going to be good for them politically, so they keep the schools closed. No way. So we're very much going to put pressure on uh, governors and everybody else to open the schools. Jonathan Swain, we don't know whether schools are going to be open for in-person in the fall. If schools stay with distance learning, how is that going to impact all the work that you're doing to sort of fill in the gaps and get kids ready to be prepared for college? Well, we, we hope there's not a negative impact. Um, obviously, kids are going to miss out from being with one another, and there's something about their physical development or, or psychological development that comes when kids are together. So I hope that's probably the thing that they're going to lose. But we're trying to fill those gaps. I mean, we're trying to provide laptops for all of our students to make sure that that insecurity, that technological insecurity that many of them have experienced is no longer there. And then we're also trying to create spaces for them, safe spaces where they can navigate these issues, try to you know contemplate them and develop their own thoughts around them, just as we are um, uh, as adults. So th those are two things I think we're focusing on primarily that are going to help us make this uh, school year successful. You know, Vince, that's another issue that we saw over the last few months, talking to members of the Hispanic Latino community, distance learning. They don't have access to the technology. How have you been able to get past that where they might have not have laptops or iPads or something like that? Well, some of them have been supplemented by the school programs. Uh, our own centers, we actually have uh, laptop and tablet rentals that we give out to the kids, similar to what Jonathan does with his program. Uh, so that's helped out a lot. We've also helped use other nonprofit links and sources to try to make sure that they're getting affordable Wi-Fi because that's another issue is that 
you know, just because you have a device doesn't mean that you actually can get online with a reliable internet connection to do things like we're doing today. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Jonathan Swain and Vince Mino, good luck with your programs this summer, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Paris. Thank you. It was while out in an estate sale last September that Chicago artist Shannon Downey found an unfinished quilt and knew that she had to complete it, but she'd need some help. Arts correspondent Angel Ito caught up with her just before the pandemic hit and shares more on how a project known as Rita's Quilt brought women from around the country together. Rita Smith of Mount Prospect, Illinois, was 99 years old when she started a quilt of the United States. Now, she died before she could finish it, and that's how it ended up at an estate sale. When I walked in, there was this absolutely gorgeous hand-embroidered map of the U.S. on the wall with all of the state flowers. And I just sort of like floated over to it and took it off the wall. And, but as I started looking at it, I realized, like, wow, this woman was an amazing stitcher. With the U.S. map at the center, the quilt also called for 50 unfinished blue stars, as well as 50 unfinished states, official state birds and flowers, all on individual hexagons. When I met Downey at Wishcraft Workshop, they helped me create my own star to get an idea of just how much work had to be done. Are you ready? I think so. Okay, great. So I'm going to come, come away. This, this is, is the hardest hard. part. You just get like, used to it. Oh, maybe soon. that's No, like, that's great. Look at that. Wow. You just stitched. Oh, my gosh. Look at oh. oh. And, and then like, you did that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Downey decided in order to finish the quilt, she would need help. So she put out a call on Instagram. And then within 24 hours, a thousand people had not just like said, I'll do it, but like, if you don't give me Colorado, I'm going to be so mad. Downey sent hexagons to more than 30 states and two Canadian provinces. And in nearly three months time, all of the hexagons were complete. The last step was bringing the pieces together to form the quilt having 35 different sewers come and we spent eight hours in this space hand piecing the entire quilt top in one day. Um, yeah, it was amazing. And in, I was like, nobody flexes harder than quilters. For the women that were able to make it from around the country, this piecing party in December was about more than the quilt finally coming together. It was about finally meeting the members of this new community. I remember I, I was following the stories and the people, oh, I'm going to try this with the bird, or Here, here's the progress on this. So I remember seeing, you know, like I was at the table with Tiffany, who did Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I remember you. And so I just wanted to extend, a, yet again, a way of putting more beauty into the world, as well as supporting women and supporting crafts and craftivism, because I think it's an important way of using our hands to tell our stories. Honoring, like, this aspect of like well, what is women's work and now watching it kind of like change through the resurgence of like craft and activism. It's this combination of craftivism that Downey is currently fulfilling on her road trip across the country where she'll show Rita's quilt. Through small meetings and virtual stitch-ups, she hopes to foster necessary conversations with art as the mediator. I just want you to show up and I want you to see what was possible and how all these people who definitely have very different beliefs and understandings of things in the world, like still just sort of came together, did this thing, and now we're all deeply connected. And isn't that what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to, to bring these folks together for Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. The finished quilt and accompanying exhibit were on display at the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky, one full day before the pandemic hit, and then they were forced to close. It will remain there until September before joining Shannon Downey on her badass cross-stitch tour that began last week. She plans to be on tour for at least a year. And now we check back in with Amanda Vinicky, who is co-anchoring tonight from Chicago's Lincoln Square neighborhood. Amanda. Yes, Paris, I am here. The Pretzelmeister is still at it. We'll get back to that later. But for right now, joined by the local alderman, that is Alderman Matt Martin of the 47th Ward. Thanks so much for joining us. And obviously, every ward in the city has gone through so much this year. What has the experience been like here in the 47th? It's an area that has a lot of restaurants, a lot of stores, 
a lot of really energized and committed people. Yeah, we have been struggling just like all other communities throughout Chicago have been um, due to COVID. And so we're just trying to come together to make sure that we can find ways to support one another. Um, we are as a city and state faring better than a lot of other places when it comes to managing COVID, but we don't want to take anything for granted, especially when it comes to employees and others who are at our restaurants and bars. So we want to make sure that folks continue to wear masks, that they are social distancing appropriately, and then we can have folks from the community come in, do takeout, mutual aid networks, finding ways to continue supporting one another. And I'm sure there are people all over the city who would lay claim to this, but uh, at least one Lincoln Square resident said that they have the best shared street in all of Chicago, Leland Avenue. How's that working out? It's working out really well. And yes, we have a few others of those throughout the city. Ours is the first, and I would submit that it's the best. Um, it's been working out really well. We've been able to close down that street to through traffic. So if you're a resident, you can still park, but we want to make sure that as folks, they are feeling how narrow those sidewalks are, that they can bike, they can walk, um, they can jog into the street in a way that's safe. And I think that it's going to be really wonderful as the summer goes on to have that expanded space so that people can socially distance appropriately, but still be outdoors a little bit more. And that, of course, was put into place because of COVID-19. But do you see this as a lasting change? It's possible. It's the sort of thing where before we brought on the shared street concept, uh, before we adopted it, we talked with a lot of residents. First, it was through this initial Greenway project that we're going to adopt soon to make it more bike friendly. And then it was an interactive map. So people, not just along Leland, Leland, but throughout the ward, could let us know if they wanted this and if so, where. So we have that sort of community buy-in. I wouldn't want to do anything like that before coming back to the community. But a lot of other cities, especially in other parts of the world, in Europe, they do that. Uh, with some frequency and I think that it's something that we definitely want to consider uh, so long as it continues to be safe and the community likes it. Now something that you've been heavily involved in is what are the next steps with the Chicago Police Department and what the police force should be doing, what it should look like. Yeah, there are three big things that are in the hopper right now that we need to get right immediately. One, and a big one, is the consent decree, that federal oversight over the police department and other public safety entities, a huge document that talks from soup to nuts, training, supervision, officer mental health and wellness, and accountability. We're really behind. We've missed about 70% of our deadlines over the last year. We need to pick that up. Second is making sure that our CBAs, uh, not just for our supervisors, but for our line officers, that they have improved provisions in there, especially around accountability, because if we're holding officers accountable more often when misconduct occurs, that helps improve trust, which helps improve homicide uh, and gun violence clearance rates going up. Right now, they're much too low. And then finally, a civilian oversight over our police department. That's something that we've heard consistently from constituents before and especially after the recent protests, that they want to see that. We've got two versions that we're considering on city council. We need to pass that as quickly as possible. And we have a very brief bit of time, but which do you favor? I know that they're difficult to sort of parse out, but you have a favorite. So we have heard from residents about both. More recently, folks have reached out a lot about CPAC. I want to make sure that we pass the strongest possible version. And so I think that there are elements from both that are really strong. What we're in the process of doing is bringing folks together who support both other folks on council to make sure that that's going to happen. Wanting something to happen. Thank you so very much to 47th Ward Alderman Matt Martin. And Paris, back to you. All right, thanks, Amanda. And up next, a cool treat for a hot day. Jeffrey Bayer joins us to dig into some Chicago ice cream history. Ask Jeffrey is made possible in part by BMO Harris Bank. Wow, you ready? Yeah, let me just grab my wallet. Uh-oh, I've seen this before. Wallet way too big, skinny jeans too skinny. I'll just carry it. Before you break something, you should know you don't actually need a wallet. With BMO Harris, you can just take cash out with your phone. Or if you need to, you can pay them with Zelle. That works? Yeah. You're stuck, aren't you? Smile. <laughs> Woo! Those jeans are way too tight. That feeling you get when no wallet is no big deal. That's the BMO effect. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan turned his sweet tooth into national news when he decreed the month of July to be National Ice Cream Month. That's why Jeffrey Bayer considers it his patriotic duty to give us the scoop on some sweet, creamy history in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey. 
Uh, anything for the team. Anything for the team. All right, they give you the tough assignments. So a few weeks ago, you answered a question about the building material known as the Chicago brick. So tonight we have a follow up to that question. This is from Mary Ulrich in Ravenswood Garden. She wants to know your segment on brick reminded me of an ice cream treat. I remember from the 1950s called Chicago brick. It was orange sherbet with vanilla and caramel. I'd like to know its history, whether it was just a regional flavor and if it is still available. Well, Paris, I have to admit, this is the first time I have ever heard of Chicago brick ice cream. But, you know, if President Reagan wanted us all to binge on ice cream this month, it's a good time to tackle the question, and it's definitely ice cream weather out there right now. It definitely is. It's the first time I've heard of this. So what exactly is Chicago brick ice cream? Right. So people can probably picture Neapolitan ice cream, mm -hmm. um, which is divided into lateral sections of chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. So as our viewer points out, Chicago brick ice cream was basically the same idea, except that the layers were different. They were orange sherbet, vanilla, and caramel. Okay, so why do they take that Neapolitan ice cream and call it Chicago brick? Does it actually have to do with clay bricks? Well, you know, that was my first theory. Um, and as you can see <laughs> in this image, uh, the colors uh, of the flavors mixed together definitely do resemble the color palette of real Chicago bricks, which I featured a few weeks ago on Ask Jeffrey. Uh, but we could not find any evidence uh, that the name has anything to do with that. And in fact, um, this ice cream variety wasn't even unique to Chicago. We found ads for Chicago brick ice cream um, as far away as Oklahoma and Nebraska in the 1910s and the 1930s. Uh, so, of course, you know, not knowing where else to turn, we, we asked Chicago cultural historian Tim Samuelson about this confectionery conundrum. Um, and he broke it down. He said that as far as the brick part of the name, well, that was just once a common reference to the shape of a block of ice cream, no matter what the flavor. Um, in fact, in as early as the 1960s, uh, excuse me, 1860s, um, bricks of ice cream became popular in sweet shops all over the country. Um, the shop would cut a brick shaped slab and wrap it up for you to take home. And then you'd slice it up into individual servings. Um, now this flavor called Chicago brick started appearing in ice cream parlors um, in the mid 1880s and it could be found in grocery stores um, starting in the late 1940s um, and a few local manufacturers produced chicago brick flavor including borden's walgreens and dean's um, but as far as why the name chicago is in there unfortunately tim samuelson came up dry as well and if tim samuelson doesn't know you know it's a deep mystery so jeffrey can you get it anywhere today well, it was out of stock at every store we checked. Um, it is still made by one local ice cream producer called DFA Brands in Batavia and sold under the Dean's Country Fresh label, but they only release it as an occasional limited edition. Our contact at DFA said that if they get enough requests, you know, they might bring the flavor back. So we could start a movement here, folks, if you, if you want. Uh, to, to taste a bit of Chicago history, give them a call. I anticipate a letter writing campaign after this episode. Anyway, you you were holding a bowl of supposed Chicago brick ice cream up earlier. So what, what was that? Yeah, next to the brick wall. Okay, well, we, we cheated a little there. Um, our producer, Erica Gunderson, um, discovered that an ice cream parlor in Wilmette called Homer's carries the three separate flavors um, uh, and uh, so she asked them to pack them into a single quart to simulate Chicago brick but Homer's doesn't actually offer that. Are there uh, any other Chicago flavored ice cream flavors? Uh, well there there is another one and it has a misleading name South Siders probably know the Palmer House flavor um, as the middle layer of a rainbow cone, which, you know, if you come from down on the south side, that's the towering five layer treat from the nearly century old shop of the same name, uh, which is in the Beverly neighborhood. Uh, Palmer House is a vanilla ice cream studded with cherries and walnuts, but it was not invented at the legendary Palmer House Hotel. According to Rainbow Cone's owner, Lynn Sapp, um, her grandfather, Joseph Sapp, the shop's founder, wanted to put a Chicago stamp on a New York ice cream that was vanilla and cherry flavor, and it was called Palmer. So he added walnuts to the recipe, and he added the name uh, House 
um, so that it honors the legendary Palmer House Hotel. Oh, and by the way, Dove bars were also invented in Chicago. Um, Chicago candy store owner Leo Stefanos invented the uh, chocolate dipped ice cream bar in the 1950s, supposedly after seeing his son running recklessly down the street after an ice cream truck. He decided it would make his son safer if he just invented his own ice cream bar. Oh, and, and by the way, um, as for your introduction mentioning Ronald Reagan's proclamation, actually the president only decreed July 1984 as National Ice Cream Month, but that hasn't stopped the dairy industry from promoting it every July since then. Well then, Jeffrey, I'll say to you, happy Ice Cream Month, and thank you so much. My pleasure. And don't forget that you can visit our website for more of Chicago's history. And while you're there, don't forget to submit your own question to Jeffrey Bayer. That's all at WTTW.com news. Their mission is to inspire people to discover why design matters. The home of the Chicago Architecture Center is both a gallery of supersized scale models and a hub for their tours, and they just reopened. Arts producer Mark Vitale visited the CAC in the spring to find out how they had pivoted to the pandemic. Here's another look at how they did some cool stuff that is now open to the public again. On East Wacker Drive, the Chicago Architecture Center has a view of landmark buildings. Inside, there is an ever-evolving scale model of the city. The center's mezzanine contains a skyline filled with models of innovative buildings from Chicago and around the world. In accordance with the shutdown, the space is currently not welcoming visitors for the 85 tours they offer but you can still explore Chicago architecture and get a tour from your home. Once we closed on March 13th, within 10 days, we had a whole new program called CAC at Home, Chicago Architecture Center at Home. And it includes everything from live programs to virtual tours. We actually tour the city, so we have a docent with a selfie stick that goes out and talks about commercial buildings or Art Deco buildings. And then we also have programs that are related to some of the issues we're dealing with, like what's the office of the future look like? You know, are people going to be afraid of cities as they come back? So some, you know, more thought-provoking things. Pedro Perfecto Arquitecto. And they have resources for kids in English and Spanish. Look at these awesome examples of Victorian homes. And new tours in and around Chicago neighborhoods. So we all know that with the lakefront being closed, all of a sudden our neighborhoods are really being pressed to have that gathering spot. Not all neighborhoods are equal in terms of having that green space. And here, if we look all the way up the Monadnock building. We're so fortunate because we have over 400 volunteers, our docents that we train, and they've really risen to the challenge in terms of how do I interact with an audience. WTTW viewers will recognize one longtime CAC docent, Jeffrey Bear. He still is a docent. He's an Architecture River Cruise docent and still teaches a class to our docents about how to give a presentation. When in-person tours do commence, visitors can once again visit the scale model of the city with 4,000 buildings. The accompanying film tells the dramatic story of the building of Chicago and its Native American origins. Projections chart the fiery path of the inferno that nearly consumed the city in October 1871. The center also founded a network of architectural organizations around the world. Recently, their leadership spoke via Zoom to consider the impact of COVID-19. We talked about what's going to happen with cities, what's going to happen with densities, how are we having these conversations. And we all still believe in cities, but we know, just like after 9-11, you know, our environments changed dramatically, but we learned to live with it. We had security in buildings, but we also changed our own behavior. That will be a result of what's happened with COVID, but people will still believe in cities, and we still believe in them. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. I can't wait to see that scale model again. It's something else. The physical headquarters of the Chicago Architecture Center reopened this week, but with limited hours and safety precautions. Find out more on our website. Before we go, some viewer feedback. Last night, Carol Marine and her guests talked about language some see as outdated and need for a change, like the name Boys Town and the term Master Bedroom. So here's what some of you had to say about the controversy. I don't care whether the name changes, but what are we doing? What kind of precedent have we set? Cancel culture, knee-jerk reactions, and boycotting fuel further division and detract from any meaningful discourse. There's something wrong with people who are resistant to change. 
taking it a bit overboard. This just makes conversation a minefield where everyone is afraid to say anything to anyone. Fix economic inequality. That will benefit everyone far more than this nonsense. And as always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website, wttw.com news. And we're joined again by Amanda Vinicky, who spent the day in Lincoln Square. Amanda, we hear you have a pretzel from the Pretzelmeister. Yes, the pretzel meister Reinhard Richter has completed his pretzels. He said this was a hobby after he couldn't find anywhere in Chicago that made a good one. So he got a recipe from his uncle in Germany. And let me tell you, here's the one that I took a bite of earlier. Wearing my mask not only for safety, but to cover up all the poppy seed that's in my teeth. So again, aid in-person classes throughout the rest of the summer through August, also on Zoom. Looks like a masterpiece. Paris, they're pretty good. Uh, save one for me if you could, Amanda. And sure thing. That is our show for this Thursday night. Please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And we leave you tonight with a star-studded version of a song you've heard a million times, but never quite like this, Sweet Home Chicago, performed by a number of Chicago natives in an effort to raise money for the Art for Illinois Relief Fund. You can see the entire video on the website. And now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Amanda Vinicky. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thanks for watching, and good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm whose pro bono work kept open a church shelter for the homeless in Chicago's southern suburbs. Oh,